Jamchip. In essence, the rise of these leaders like Kukka Pare, Nabba Azad and Papa Kishtwari reflected the new balance of power. Their unfurling of the Indian tricolor at Lal Chowk in the heart of Srinagar was simply an assertion of this new aggressive stand and nothing short of a snub to militancy in the state. And was this what he meant by final fate? In some respects, the Chirar fiasco can be counted as that one incident that morally jolted the armed struggle in the valley. Torching of this 14th century Sufi shrine by Mustgul, an Afghan mercenary, symbolized all that had gone wrong with the militancy movement, exposing in graphic detail the leading role mercenaries from Afghanistan, Sudan, Yemen, and of course Pakistan had begun to play in propping up this so-called jihad. August 1995, a Congress rally at Chandusa, Baramula, the first political activity since violence erupted in the valley. Yet the Chandusa rally was a first in more ways than one. It actually signaled for the first time that the battle for Kashmir had taken a new turn. Sensing the new atmosphere, a frenzy of political activity soon began to make their presence felt. The battle for Kashmir, it seems, was well and truly on. It is no secret that the success of the parliamentary polls in Kashmir earlier in 1996 was not some newfound love for democracy or anything else, but a genuine disenchantment with the gun culture. After all, sooner or later, the call for Azadi or independence had to make way for more basic issues, like perhaps survival. In essence, the parliamentary polls served more like a testing of waters for the Indian government, a calculated move that paid off in the final analysis. What started out as a symbolic protest soon turned into an avalanche. Candidates and supporters, a little apprehensive during the parliamentary polls, were more aggressive for the assembly elections. It was nowhere near the enthusiasm and festival-like atmosphere one witnessed before 1989, but it was a miracle nevertheless. It had been quite some time since media men witnessed such huge serpentine queues. In village after village, thousands asserted their democratic right to vote. This new search for democracy had its own ironies. Lodged in various jails, the story of the valley's detained militants represents another aspect of Kashmir, an aspect sandwiched within a raging storm called Jihad and then society's eventual disillusionment with it. Luckily for us, our visit to the special task force lockup in Srinagar coincided with reunion time. Parents and family members were meeting their children in the prison compound amid scenes of joy and tears. Yet even in this crowd were some lonely tears shed, perhaps for loved ones who couldn't make it today. The fate of these detainees symbolizes the dilemma Kashmir faces in its search for peace. Would the guilty be punished? Or would justice be sacrificed at the altar of reconciliation? At stake is the future of not only the families dependent on these prisoners, but also the anger of those 
whose kith and kin they killed. Somehow, the sensitivity with which this crisis is handled could symbolize what fate held in store for Kashmir. After the scars of this conflict are much more deeper than can be imagined. More than 3 lakh Kashmiri pundits, 20,000 Sikhs, and some 30,000 Muslims live as refugees in their own nation, forced to migrate from their homes at the peak of militancy. Perhaps the severest affected in this exodus have been the Kashmiri pundits. Homeless since 1989, even today, a majority of this exiled community live in refugee camps across the nation. However, the irony of the situation is that even with the revival of popular rule, the Pandit community seems reluctant to return home. Their reluctance stemming from their apprehensions, uncertainties and even fear about the ground realities in the valley. Would the Muslim majority be willing to accept them back? Then, there are obvious questions about security and compensation for burnt, broken and occupied houses and lands. While it is true that the return of the migrants would be the greatest psychological victory in the valley's new quest for normalcy, will this really be allowed to happen? Talking to the new chief minister, I sensed a man painfully aware of the dilemma Kashmir faces. That is how it is, the tragedy of it. You come and talk to them and tell them what have you achieved. Discussions on the return of migrants and the various plans involved for their rehabilitation seemed all right. But were these really enough to rid them of their fear psychosis? It is no secret that even with the revival of popular rule, the uncertainties and even fear about the militants and their political win, the Hurriyat Conference could possibly shape the future of the valley. Yet, as of today, the Hurriyat Conference is a house seemingly in disarray. Its most popular leader, Shabir Shah, has been suspended from its primary membership. Formed amidst great expectations in December 92, this political umbrella for the various secessionist forces has somehow squandered away its initial popularity. Tugged by passionate politicking of the various militant outfits, the Hurriyat has failed to give a decisive political direction to the separatist movement. Add to that its failure in reigning in Al-Faran militants and subsequently its inability to break the stalemate in the foreign tourist abduction case. Thus the only weapon the Hurriyat possessed to confirm to the world its stranglehold in the valley was to impose strikes and bans. However, mere hartal or strike calls at the drop of a hat have only served to damage its credibility in the eyes of the already beleaguered business community. It's no coincidence then that the rise of Dr. Farooq Abdullah and the National Conference and the descent and downfall of the Hurya are part of the same changing equation of reality. As I grapple the intricacies of this ever-changing political chessboard, I found myself at the very place where it all restarted. The resurgence, I mean. The reconstructed Chinare Sharif. It wasn't anything like the old structure. But then, who said that culture or tradition were just some four walls and a roof on top? Built in memory of the great Sufi saint, Nundrishi, the reconstruction of the Chirar symbolized to many a reconstruction or reawakening of Kashmir. A mausoleum for Nundrishi and his disciples, the Chirar in a sense represented all that was Kashmiri, its Sufiistic leanings and of course, its secular and cultural traditions. And then, as if by chance, a noise. 
a crowd had developed in the shrine's compound out of nowhere. It seemed as if the entire township of Chirara had assembled in the shrine. I must admit, our first reaction was to run from harm's way. But then a closer scrutiny revealed that the people had not assembled to create trouble, as might have been expected a couple of years back. A rumor had been spread. The word was out that a holy relic that had vanished the night shroud got burned had not after all been completely destroyed. A local inhabitant had taken the relic for safekeeping and had found the day auspicious to reveal his well-kept secret to the entire world. So was this a divine signal or just a lucky break for me and my camera team? At the end of the day, I really didn't know what to make of it. So many thoughts, emotions and feelings seemed to engulf me at once. It was apparent that I had no answers. Not as yet anyway. But in the meanwhile, there would always be hope to return home to the land of my dreams, my childhood, my roots, one day when all would be well. Just as many of my forefathers had done centuries back, escaping from the valley during different eras, different regimes, but always from the same fundamental persecution. Yet, return they always did, as I would one day, hopefully. <laughs>